I'm George Benson, president of the College of Charleston. I'm pleased to be with you for this uh, very special event this evening. I want to make sure we thank Motley Rice for the support uh, this evening. I know there's some people here from Motley Rice. Would you please put your hands up so we can thank you? <laughs> we literally couldn't have done this without you, so we're very grateful. Uh, the Flint Friends of the Library, as most of you know, plays a, a very important role in helping us grow and strengthen this wonderful library that we have. Usually we're standing in it for this, but we're not tonight, over there on the other side of uh, campus. But in, in turn, that helps our, our students, it, it helps our staff, it helps our faculty, and it helps the community at large here in Charleston. Our library, Adelstone Library, is an asset for, for all of us, for the entire community, and your, your help and support is, is greatly appreciated. I also wanted to thank uh, Chaplain McKay, who's sitting down here, uh, for his leadership with the Friends of the Library, and actually for, for much more than that. Chaplain's been intimately and heavily involved with the college and committed to many of our programs for many, many years. Chaplain, I thank you for all that you're doing for us. And I also want to thank all of you who are Friends of the Library. It, it makes a big difference. The library is important to all of us. It is the intellectual hub of our university, and your support is greatly appreciated. Uh, the Winthrop Roundtable, as, as we all know, uh, attracts uh, notable speakers uh, every single year. Uh, we've had uh, John Kerry, uh, not too far, not too long ago, now Secretary of State uh, of the United States. Uh, Linda Gradstein, we call, award-winning journalist and former NPR correspondent was with, it, with us. Uh, Jeff Ilmel, the CEO of uh, General Electric, uh, and on and on. Uh, and tonight is no exception. We're fortunate to have former South African Constitutional Court Justice uh, Albie Sachs, uh, with us, uh, Justice Sachs is an internationally acclaimed freedom fighter, a human rights advocate, and a pillar of the international law community. And we're all privileged to get to hear from him this evening. Uh, he's been in Charleston for the 39th annual African Literature Association Conference, which concluded earlier today. The conference was organized and brought to Charleston and to the college by our very own Simon Lewis, who's a professor of English, and I'll be introducing Simon to you uh, more formally in a few minutes. I, I had an opportunity to help open the conference uh, on Wednesday, uh, and a wonderful, interesting collection of, of scholars and others from around the country and around the world uh, were there. Also, while we're standing in, in this uh, uh, TD arena in the Callister Suite, let me mention something that went on this weekend at the College of Charleston. It's quite an extraordinary event. It was our fourth annual Accepted Students Weekend. We had close to 3,000 students and, and their families here in town. That helps our hotels, that helps our restaurants, that helps our shops as, as well. Uh, also makes the streets a little more crowded. Uh, but they spent two days with us uh, learning more about the college. The idea is we're trying to, trying to seduce them. Trying to, they've been accepted, we want them to come here. We found that roughly 80% of the students that come to Accepted Students Weekend uh, will come to the college. I came in here Saturday morning uh, to, to see them and speak to them, uh, came into the far entrance of TD Arena, walked right onto the basketball floor and looked up and said, my goodness, this place is full. The entire downstairs was filled with students and their parents. Later, uh, they all paraded over to uh, George Street and, 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 and many of our different uh, uh, services, our, our different organizations, our fraternities, our sororities, our, our, our student service organizations were there uh, displaying what they do for them. They had a session in uh, Physicians Auditorium just for the parents to learn about study abroad programs, to learn about financial aid and things like that. I walked in there, it was packed. Anyway, it was a remarkable weekend. We got a little bit wet toward the end of it, but uh, it all came off very well, and I thought you'd like to know about that. Now, let me change topics. Uh, since 1855, the South Carolina Historical Society has documented, it's preserved, and it's promoted our state's rich history. Uh, the society has become an important academic resource for, for the college and our students, for the low country, more generally for the state and even the nation. Uh, the college is proud of us, the relationship that we've had with society. In fact, we can trace our earliest relationship back to 1856, which they held, in which the society held its first anniversary meeting in the college's chapel, which today is known as Alumni Hall uh, inside uh, Randolph Hall. The relationship continues to this, this day with student internships, uh, being involved with the society, our faculty serving on the editorial board of the South Carolina Historical Magazine, and, and so forth. And tonight, I am truly pleased to announce that our relationship is expanding and expanding in a very significant way. The college has entered into an agreement 
of the South Carolina Historical Society to house a significant portion of its archival collection in our Addlestone Library. So beginning in 2015, this new partnership will enable the college to make much more accessible the society's repository of books, letters, journals, maps, drawings, photographs, and so forth. And this will also help to ensure that the Addlestone Library remains a hub for research and intellectual discovery here in the Low Countries. We're very excited about that. Merging these collections, that is our collection, with their collection. The college will host the oldest and largest collections on Southern and South Carolina history and culture anywhere in the world. So we're very, very pleased with that new development. I wanted to thank a few people who helped make that uh, possible. The South Carolina Historical Society's Board of Managers. I don't know if anybody is here from that, but thank you. Uh, Faye Jensen, Faye, I think you are here. Faye, where, where are you? Put, put your hand up or stand up over here. Faye is the executive director of the society. And Faye, we thank you for helping to make this uh, possible. The faculty and staff and our libraries and our Department of History also played a big role. But there was one uh, a real star of the show, and that's David Cohen. David is the dean of our School of Languages. <laughs> for three decades of service as Dean of the Libraries and, and Special Collections. And under your leadership, our libraries have become literally a point of pride, something I brag about in, in speech after speech, and a signature asset for the college. And thank you for all you've done for us, and particularly for this, this, last, uh, this last venture. OK, I'd now like to introduce uh, Simon Lewis. Simon is a professor of English. He's Director of African Studies and Associate Director of the College's Carolina Low Country and Atlantic World Program, also known by the acronym CLAW. A CLAW was created to encourage public understanding of the economic, the social, the political, and the cultural history of the South Carolina Low Country, and the broader Atlantic world, and the connections and relationships between those two. Simon holds bachelor's and master's degrees in English literature from Oxford University and a doctorate in English from the University of Florida. From 1996 to 2011, he was the editor of Illuminations, an international literary magazine. He's the author of two books, and he's a leader in the field of South African, African, and post-colonial literature. And with that, would you please welcome Professor Simon Lewis. Simon. I'm a little tired and still rather emotional after four intense days of conference of uh, literature liberation in the law. The African Literature Association's contribution to the College of Charleston's led Jubilee Project, which is commemorating the 150th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation and the 50th anniversary of the desegregation of South Carolina's educational institutions, such as the Charleston County Schools District. Justice Albie Sachs gave the conference's concluding keynote address on Saturday. It was a truly inspiring talk, and very graciously and very effectively, Albie also participated in numerous other panels. And by the way, I'm not being disrespectful when I refer to him as Albie. Part of his enormous integrity is the fact that he refuses to be called Judge Sachs. Uh, he wishes to be called Albie. Uh, Albie was awarded the ALA's highest accolade, the Fonlon Nichols Award. It's an award given to a distinguished writer who has made significant contributions to the advancement of human rights. Previous winners include Nigeria's Nobel Prize winner, Wale Shuenka, Somali novelist, Nuruddin Farah, and Albi's fellow South African, Dennis Brutus. Now, although it's not actually stipulated in the criteria for winning the Fondon Nichols Award, qualifications for the award effectively require the writer to have been imprisoned, exiled, tortured, shot or bombed. In Albie's case, four of the above. In nominating Albie for the award, I wrote the following introductory paragraph encapsulating my justification for the nomination. South African writer, activist, and jurist Albie Sachs is outstandingly well qualified to be the recipient of the 2013 Fonlon Nichols Award. As a writer, he is one of only two South Africans ever to have won the Alan Payton Award twice. As an activist in the struggle for human rights and freedom of expression, 
He has emerged from the brutalization he received at the hands of the apartheid state to become one of post-apartheid South Africa's fiercest defenders of equal rights for all enshrined in that country's remarkable constitution, the document he played an important role in drafting. He risked body and soul in the struggle against apartheid. Through his eloquent descriptions of that struggle, his voice was one of the many that combined to make apartheid South Africa a pariah state before 1990. And through his balance of legal logic and humane wisdom, he has helped ensure that post-apartheid South Africa honors its new constitution's commitment to protect all South Africa citizens, regardless of race, gender, ethnicity, or sexuality. Throughout his long and distinguished career, Sachs has displayed a generous and self-effacing modesty that is the mark of the true moral hero. So Albie's heard that paragraph before, and he's heard many more like it wherever he has gone since retiring from the Constitutional Court in South Africa some years ago. I'm not now going to run through his biography for you any further, however. I want to take you back 50 years to 1963, the year when Albie was first jailed by the apartheid state. To the time, in other words, before he could possibly have known the arc his life was to follow, from prisoner to exile to enemy of the state and victim of an assassination attempt to constitutional court judge and internationally renowned jurist. In the early 1960s, as a young lawyer in his 20s, Sachs had choices. He could have obeyed the law, he could have been sensible and concentrated on building the best career for himself. He chose not to do that. Because the law of the land, the law he was expected to practice, was plainly not synonymous with justice. So he defied it. And you have to understand, you really have to understand how unsensible that was. In 1960, March the 21st to be precise, just a couple of days ago, so we just passed the anniversary of that occasion, 69 peaceful protesters were shot dead by the police in Sharpeville, South Africa. Now, racial rule in South Africa had been in place ever since European settlers had arrived there in 1652, a bare 18 years before Charleston was settled. But formal apartheid had been instituted only in 1948, bucking the worldwide trend at that time after the end of World War II, which had been towards the liberation of formerly colonized peoples worldwide. Now, initially, it had seemed possible that this aberrant election result might have been overturned by legal and political process. The Sharpeville massacre put an end to that liberal delusion. The South African regime played for keeps, and Albie knows that um, Hilda Bernstein's novel of this period is called Death is Part of the Process. And when another moral hero of our time, Nelson Mandela, having been captured after two years' underground activity as the Black Pimpernel, was put on trial in the Ravonia trial in 1963, the same year Albie went to jail. Everyone expected him to be found guilty, which he was, and sentenced to death, which he was not. But nobody, nobody could have predicted in 1963 that the convicted terrorist Nelson Mandela and the jailed dissident Albie Sachs would respectively have ended up as President of South Africa and Constitutional Court Justice. Somehow, however, both Mandela and Sachs, along with other incredibly brave South Africans, were able to find the courage to imagine the better world that they brought into being. And the truly extraordinary thing about that new world was that when it arrived, Sachs, Mandela, Desmond Tutu, just to give you the familiar headline names, they brought it into being completely unvindictively. What Albi describes as his soft vengeance of a freedom fighter has been structurally mirrored by the process of reconciliation instituted by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, a body Albi was intimately connected with, and also by its extraordinary constitution that guarantees the rights of all South Africans regardless of race, color, creed, gender, or sexuality. And the reason I'm stressing 1963 is that I think Albi's experience may tell us something not just about his own incredible individual bravery, but also from his experience of structures, of politics, of building a healthy collectivity. I think it might tell us something of how we might deal with our own remarkably similar, similar but different as my students like to say, our similar history here in Charleston, South Carolina. 
because 1963 is the year that Harvey Gantt, Millicent and Minerva Brown and others similarly made dangerously unsensible choices by challenging the law and integrating Charleston County Schools and Clemson. Maybe I'm being presumptuous about what Albie may want to say to us. I should perhaps revert to a more standard discourse of introduction. This morning in church, we sang a beautifully resonant hymn that made me immediately want to use it because it catches Albie's remarkable positivity. It's one of those classically secular Unitarian hymns that Garrison Keillor likes to make fun of in Prairie Home Companion. It goes like this. If they ask what I did best, tell them I said yes to life. And then subsequent verses go on. If they ask what I did best, tell them I said yes to truth. And it concludes, if they ask what I did best, tell them I said yes to love. Albie Sachs is a moral hero for our time precisely because he has always, however crazily risky it may have been, he has always said yes to life, yes to truth, and yes ultimately to love. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my great honor and privilege to be able to introduce to you Justice Albert Louis Sachs. I 
the bomber, or Kansas, Arizona, and I'm counting on my fingers, I had 10 fingers then. I can't write it down, I guess, with the B's, the C's, the D's. I think I got up to 47 once. I don't know what the three states were that I didn't make, that I didn't get. It was just a little game to keep my mind active when I'm speaking to myself. I would sing just to hear my voice. My favorite song was, I'd, I'd go through the alphabet and sing a song beginning with A, always, B because, C. Charmaine, people who were around in those days will remember the hit tunes of 1963. Daisy, I remember X was difficult, so I treated deep in the heart of Texas. <laughs> and my favorite was Always. I'm sure most of you know Always, the Irving Berlin tune, in honor of his wife which was picked up by, uh, in, by Noel Coward in Blythe Spirit. I'll be living here always, year after year, always, in this little cell that I know so well. I'll be living swell always, always, I'd sort of waltz around and I'd feel amused at this Noel Coward tune used for comedy of upper middle class manners in England. It was keeping this young freedom fighter in good metal in a prison cell in Cape Town. I'd be staying in always, keeping up my chin always, not for about an hour. Not for but a week, not for 90 days, but always. And I would twirl around again. There was nothing to do. The only reading matter I had was the Bible. And I would rest myself two pages in these long columns, two and a half pages a day. So I didn't know how long I'd be retained. 90 days, another 90 days, another 90 days. I didn't know why I'd been retained. There was no charge. When they interrogated me, they would say, are you willing to answer questions? I'd say, it depends what the questions are. And they would say, we will tell you the questions if you tell us you're willing to answer. And I would say, I'd only answer the questions if I know what they are. It's the kind of game that you played. I would do exercises. I would imagine I'm writing a play and it's about somebody locked up in a cell. Guess why I thought I'd do a play about somebody locked up in a cell. But the play, I imagined it to be a person in a cell and in a nearby cell there's somebody else locked up and their lives proceed without any connection between the two. Each has a whole day's journey, but they are separated. Somehow it seemed to be a symbol of the apartness of human beings in life, wanting to be connected but not having any connection with each other. And I would imagine the play is being put on at the West End in London, and I would imagine at the end there would be prolonged applause because your feeling diminished all the time that you are less and less of a human being and you mean nothing and you are fairly worthless. You don't say that in terms, but you feel somehow out of contact with other human beings. You just feel that you are not fully a human being yourself. And to overcome that, you imagine, you imagine that somebody is applauding you through this act of theatre. And I remember telling myself very, very strongly that if ever 
ever, if ever I get through this, and if ever, if ever, if ever I'm in a position of authority one day in South Africa, I will never, never, never do this to anybody else. It, it was a strange kind of feeling to try and assume that I have power over the others, when in fact I'm completely powerless. But a feeling and a determination to have a kind of a power that is so strong that you can actually not subject people to doing this to you because your morality is so much stronger. It was like a, a, an assumption, an affirmation of a moral strength that I didn't really have, but that I sought, sought to have. The terrible noises in prison, and I suspect similar all over the world. Heavy metal doors slam. People are screaming, young people are brought in. This terrible tattoo at night, banging, 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 banging. You want to say, stop it, stop it, I'm not going to be released. Stop it, stop it. You can just hear the terror, the rage, the anger of people locked up. Those are the only sounds that you hear. You don't have ordinary conversation with anybody. And one day through this din, and I could hear a clock chiming in the distance. And I would try to listen because at least gave me an idea, was it 12 noon, uh, was it 3 o'clock in the afternoon, some way of measuring the slow, tediously slow, endlessly slow, terribly slow, dragging passage of time. And even when one day ended, just be the beginning of another day, and so it would go on and on and on. And I think I hear whispering. And it wasn't a prison sound. And I listen again, and there's somebody out there in the prison who's whispering. And I whistle back, and I whistle the song, the ANC, Dennis Organization. There's no answer. I'm trying to get a connection. The chances are other people locked up would be locked up belonging to the same movement. And I try different political strongs, no response. And then I'm not sure if the whistler or I first whistled. I think it was the whistler. I've been in a 
a note of rage against my colleagues, against the judiciary. A lawyer, an advocate, going to his work gets picked up by the police, thrown into jail, the cops charge without trial, and they do nothing. What does this mean? And I just felt a fury against my colleagues and against the judges. But now I'm reading in the Supreme Court of South Africa, Cabinet of the Provincial Division. And it's before Justice Vincent J. and Banks J. In the case of Albert Louis Sachs versus Captain Johannes Kubis Rousseau. Albert Louis Sachs, oh, that, 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 that's me. It is hereby ordered that the applicant be allowed to have reading matter and write a new table. They keep nothing away. They mustn't see how joyous I feel. And suddenly the legal profession is the most marvelous thing in the whole world, being the most terrible thing in the whole world. I'm allowed to have books. And of course, that's my connection with this evening and with your life. No books, save for the Bible, and I'm rationing my glorious reading of the text. I asked for my friends to be allowed to send books into me. No. They will do something, send secret messages, codes, and so on. So what to do? They ordered to allow me to have books, but they prevented me from giving me books. And the answer? The local library. Of course, I couldn't leave the cell, go to the library, and choose the books I wanted. So I would write the name down on a piece of paper and a constable would go to the library. And I really imagined the face of the librarian when Constable von Steiden, maybe with eight years schooling, not really comfortable with English. That doesn't matter, it's not his first language. But he's asking for remembrance of things past by Marcel Clouse. You must think, this is amazing. Your ordinary, low-level constable reading Clouse, amazing. In fact, when I got it, I couldn't read it. It didn't have the emotion, the energy, the blood pulsating which I needed in this circumstance of isolation. It would have been a form of isolation within isolation, that marvelous flowing prose which I managed to read some years later. I couldn't read that. I did read Moby Dick. I've been wanting to read it for years, now was my chance. <laughs> and what a magnificent book. And a book that had action, drama, it had a visceral character that I needed with human beings acting, but also an epic quality that somehow fitted in with, with, with my mood. And, and there are two episodes I remember, not even the famous chase after the white whale, uh, the battles out at sea, but his description of people leaving the ship. And in the one case, People would go and they would swim, but they would always swim in the ocean around the ship. Even though they could swim out 50 yards and come back, they swam around the ship, so they didn't want to lose contact with that floating body. On the other hand, there was Pip who fell overboard, and he went down, 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 down to the wondrous depths, and he describes the amazing things that we saw there, the shells and the seaweed and the colours. And he came up to the top and he was never quite sane again. And I remember telling the story to the meeting of judges in Canada that we need both kinds of judges, those who swim round and round the ship, keeping close, steady, and those who go down deep into the depths.
see wondrous things and maybe get a little bit disturbed. And it's the connection between those two. Maybe all humanity requires people of that kind. And the other book that I remember so vividly was Don, we used to call it Don Wixot, Don Quixote, which I'd also wanted to read for years and never got round to. And I read the first volume, and here's this ridiculous this character trying to save a woman who hardly knows him and doesn't want to be saved by him, tilting at windmills. And he's mocked a fake, spurious chivalry. And then I read the second book, and I discover that Cervantes himself had been in prison in the the second book is so gracious and so beautiful about this person on his horse seeking justice and he charges at the enemies of justice and he gets knocked down each time and he lies in the dust and Pancho Sansa picks him up faithful to him and puts him on his horse. And again, there's something wicked that's happening. And he charges at the wickedness, real wickedness, not the spirit of chivalry. And he gets knocked down again, and he's in the dust. And he gets up on his horse. And it happens a fourth time and a fifth time. And guess who identified with? It's one of three characters in literature that I've fully identified with. It's John Quartier, knocked down off his horse, in the dust, getting up back on his horse, going on, you're not quite sure why you're going on, but you don't want to give up, just for going on. So it was books that gave me a sense of personality, of dignity, it was conversing with the words, the mind of the noble and Cervantes. Uh, I was back in a world of communication, a world of civilization, a world of human beings. I just owe so much to books. And I felt such an appreciation for that librarian who didn't even know who was sending the books to in that particular period. I told the story at a work conference of librarians in Durban. And they got so, so, so excited. And they tried to dis discover who that librarian was. <laughs> but he'd been very ill, and sadly he died at the public meeting. But it became just something that connected me up in my story with the whole profession of librarians. Now that's the end of my first story that I'm going to tell you this evening. It has a curious sequel. When years later I was blown up by a bomb put in my car by security operatives of the White James, then professor of law in Mozambique, maybe in South Africa. I recovered. I was my arm side of the eye. But I felt joyous. I'd survived. Another moment in one's life will they come for me today? Will they come for me without me praying? Will I get through? And they'd come for me, they tried to kill me, I got through, I felt fantastic. And I must say, I felt joyous since then till this day. Somehow it wiped out some of the misery and the solitary confinement. And it was as if lost the way my mom lost it away, some of the sadness and sorrow, the solitary. And I'm lying eventually in a London hospital recovery, and I think now's my chance to catch up with my reading. <laughs> and I can just about watch television. The only sport I could watch was snooker. It's so gentle. I remember trying to watch tennis. Ivan Lendl was playing. I couldn't I had to see the tension in his neck. I just needed calmness. I could watch the children's programs. I remember seeing a program so English, the 
Society for the Protection of Road Hedgehogs. <laughs> well, what an amazing country I'm in. We play each other up in South Africa and now. Road Hedgehogs. I could read newspapers with some difficulty and I get my first book. It's a thriller. Easy to read. I struggle through the first page, the second page. What's going on here? I'm not ready for it. I wait for a week, I try again. I battle, I get through to the end of the first chapter. I should be devouring books. In the interval after my 90-day detention, I never went anywhere without books. I would hide them in my raincoat pocket. I would put them under the bed like a secret drinker. I didn't want to be caught without books. And now I've got all the time in my hands and I can't read. Six months passed, I still can't read. A year passes, I can barely read a book. And I wonder what's going on here. And I decide that something in my unconscious is telling me that I'll be, your life has become more interesting than any book. You don't want to take on board any more excitement, any more imagination, any more episodes. I'm sorry to say to a large extent, that's still the situation. <laughs> I find I can read detective stories, spy thrillers, something contained in the world that is created there. But the great literature, the novels that I used to love, is too much already in my head. And I've told that story to the librarians and they weren't happy at all. <laughs> the second story is repeating what I told at the conference of British Society of Archivists. I'm quite excited to be invited by them. I'm not quite sure why they asked me, but there I was. And I started off with a joke that I've been told by an archivist that you can tell if somebody's a librarian because when they speak to you, they look down at your shoes. And you can tell when someone's an archivist because they don't even have the courage to be a librarian. <laughs> they just told to me by an archivist. I said, when I woke up this morning, I felt very distracted. My head seemed to be splitting in two. I had a sense of great displacement. Everybody's getting very alarmed. And I went to the doctor and the doctor said, uh, are you from South Africa? I said, yes. He said, I know what you're suffering from. I said, what? He said, you're suffering from archive fever. Now, archive fever was the crisis that archivists were in after the French philosopher Derrida had visited South Africa. And he was challenging the monumental power of the archive as the repository of certain knowledge, which you could then interpret the way you want. He was undermining that. He was saying, an archive isn't a repository of objective, dependable knowledge. By its very definition, each object in the archive has been extracted from its real environment. The environment and context is so important for any object, whether it's a letter, or a speech, or a piece of porcelain. There's something, in that sense, invalid in the very act of saying that this is an authentic document with a, an internal truth contained in it, when the document itself is repudiating the very provenance that created it by being placed in the archive. And secondly, he was saying that there's always somebody in charge of the archive. They decide what goes in. They decide what's important. They decide what is worthy of being classified as a document to be kept. 
And certainly in South Africa, we knew who kept the archives, be the colonial administration, the people in charge. And they kept documents which dealt with the world as they saw the world, as they administered the world. They were important documents. But to say they tell you what the history was at the time is very false because there's a history that was lived by people who didn't have a voice in the choice, who were not represented, their oral history isn't contained there at all, and the history as experienced by many other people, subaltern people, isn't represented at all. So this produced, amongst the archivists, who are feeling even through the years of apartheid, we kept some documentation that was authentic, that will survive a particular political system. They were saying that even that now, after Derrida, can't be relied upon. So I'm suffering from archive fever. They relaxed, knowing that there's no answer to that. There's no medicine that can be given. It's something you've got to live with and make the best of the materials that you've got, interpret them as best we can, and try and seek alternative forms of memorializing the past. And that can be through, can be through materials, through weapons, through cuisine, through now we do DNA from bones. We can build up the repository of knowledge about the past, but we do it through songs, through memory, through inscriptions, through a whole variety of other forms of storytelling by people whose stories weren't told or weren't kept in the archives. So we relax a little bit. In preparing for the lecture, I went to the archives in Pretoria to speak to the archivists there, all suffering from very severe archive fever, but not stopping them from carrying on with their work. And I decided to look up our sense to see what documentation they've got. Nothing. What? Was I so insignificant? <laughs> I think the most serious of the secret reports on me of the security police was still stuck away from somewhere. But when I said, why don't you try Albert Sachs? Now, Albie is my popular name. But when you're doing an archive, you don't say Albi, you don't say Tom, you say Thomas. Uh, so it was properly catalogued under Albert Sachs. And they gave me a file. And this is the file from the Ministry of Justice. The Ministry of Justice far less punitive, far less ferocious than the security police. And I'm going through it and I see there is the banning order that was issued when I was restricted from speaking in public, the motivation given. I'm quite amused to read it because it ends up, this is the order restricting me in the civil service language of the time, to a humble servant, restricting me from leaving Cape Town, from going into what's called a black area, speaking to more than two people for visiting any school and educational institution. So it's an interesting record of the past. Then I'm going through, I'm going through, I'm going through, and I see a document. In my eye, eyes light up. Two years after the solitary confinement that I've described to you, I was detained again, the second time. And this time, after 168 days, the first time. The police coming down from Johannesburg, much more serious, intensive interrogation. Keeping me up through the day, through the night, banging on the table, making a big noise, total silence, giving me something in my food, I'm fairly sure, to undermine my existence. And I guess for the night, I feel myself getting weaker and weaker and weaker 
And I know that the people that be my clients should go out for five days and then collapse completely and have no resistance at all. And suddenly I realized this time I'm going to pay. Terrible, terrible realization. And at least one must try and manage breakdown as well as possible. And I go right through the night and into the next morning. Lying on the floor, with great excitement. I see they'd been working in relays, two on and four off, two on and four off. And all six are there, and I look and I see the brown shoes and the black shoes, and they're moving around, and they're talking really animatedly to each other, and water pours down on me, and I'm lying there, and somebody puts his arms under my Armpits and lifts me up and puts me on the chair, and I collapse again. And it happens maybe three times, and I feel fingers rising, eyes open. The famous, notorious Royalist Swanepoel, the head of the interrogation squad. Many people died in these interrogation rooms. Rising, eyes open, and I sit quietly for a while. Then I start answering some questions. And I'm trying to control what I'm saying. And I say, Captain, before making any statement, I wish to place on record that I'm making the statement under duress. I describe falling off the chair, the water being poured on me and being lifted up writing it all down. And he asks me some questions and he says, why is it everybody you mentioned is either dead or out of the country? It's true. And I say, there's no answer. It's fairly perfunctory. I leave. It was the worst, worst moment of my life. A moment of total indignity, lack of will, lack of autonomy, a feeling that an unjust system was now squeezing me and using my own body to fight my mind with a sheer extreme exhaustion. I saw him shuffling the papers before I signed, but I'm too tired to know quite what's going on. I have half a fear that in fact he is leaving out the pages where I made a complaint about the circumstances. But some time later, a week or two later, a magistrate comes round inspecting the prisoners, and I tell him that story. And I forgot about it completely. And I'm going through the archives, and I see magistrate William Kemp, whatever his name is, records that advocate Alby Sachs stated to me as follows. And it was on a carbon paper. Some of you will remember carbon paper. <laughs> a flimsy. And there I read the story. And it's just me alone in Pretoria going through the documents. Nothing turns on it. I'm already a judge. I'm going to England. But I just felt it was so important for me that it wasn't just my memory, my story is told in books. Here was this independent piece of paper in the archive that somehow obliterated all the concerns, the important concerns, the challenging the contestation so necessary in terms of the objective validity of documents. Somehow this one document for me was enough the I'm almost finished. <laughs> on Wednesday night, sitting on my six-year-old child's bed, whatever, I'm going to leave early the next morning. He won't see his daddy leave. Flying to America. I'm reading him a story. 
I've been in Florence a week before to attend a conference, and an Italian professor said, Judge Aldi, there's a book you must have for your son. It's an Italian story for children, and it's, and I said, it's Pinocchio. And she was surprised that I knew Pinocchio. I think everybody knows Pinocchio. And I took the book with me. And I would read him two chapters every night, from then until I was leaving. It was just so special. I must say, I censored it a little bit. These children's stories of the 19th century are very much. I mean, poor Pinocchio is lying next to the fire and he wakes up and his feet are burnt off. And I've got to tell that to my child when he's going to sleep. But it's, it's, there was just something so special about that book. It's not Oliver loves his body's eye game, he loves playing the games, he loves looking at maps, car racing, reading things, playing with numbers, he enjoys that. He loves pop-up books, he loves books with great illustrations, he loves books that he can read himself now with simple short sentences. There was just something about his daddy reading Pinocchio to him. A book with very limited illustrations, just the words. And it wasn't on a screen, it was on paper on pages that were being turned. And I would end with chapter whatever it was, and he would drift off the screen. And it made it very clear to me that there would always be books. Books are not fighting the electronic media. I think they've got to coexist. They do coexist. They certainly coexist for them all of But something about reading the story, the connection between him and his daddy through the book, the voice that you use, the manner of telling as he's drifting off. It was a very beautiful memory for me to take on the aeroplane with me the next morning. It's a very beautiful memory that I offer to you as I end this presentation. Thank you. It's so ironic tonight that our sponsor, the uh, Motley Rice firm, uh, they are the ones who contributed to the College of Charleston uh, the funds to purchase the only copy of the Federalist Papers that is available in a public library in the state of South Carolina. And um, to those of you who may or may not know this, the Federalist Papers, of course, were the basis for the United States Constitution. So I think it's, uh, thank you, Bobby Rice, and thank you, Justice, uh, for a wonderful evening. Well, Justice Sachs, thank you so much. I was sitting there thinking that we all, everybody has a desire to serve and serve humanity. And um, so often the world stops us from stepping out there. And it's just amazing every once in a while to see somebody who has not stopped by a feeling or an emotion that went out and truly served this world. Thank you so much. You'll be here for a couple hours, but you'll be with us for the rest of our lives. Thank you very much. <clears throat> At the tables tonight, uh, we have our William Aiken Scholars. Uh, everybody who's a scholar, if you don't mind, just gonna raise your hand and let everybody know at your table who you are. These are amazing students. <laughs> These students are in our Honors College. And uh, they were selected to be William Aiken scholars because of their scores and their GPAs and their class ranks. 
But the amazing thing is, is these students have looked beyond the college walls. They're already working with their deans to promote their academic performance, to look for different events that set them apart from all other students. Uh, their eyes are on graduate schools and PhDs, not BSs and BAs. They're amazing people. Get to know that student with you. Very quickly, uh, they're getting ready to serve our dinner. I don't want to stand too far between us and dinner. In your package, you'll find uh, about the Fisk Jubilee Singers. Uh, they'll be sponsored by the Avery Institute on April 19th, uh, the Circular Congregation Church. And then we also have author Janie Mitchell joining us. The Reliable Cook is her book, which is an amazing book, on April 10th at the Alston Library. This is a Friends of the Library event. Most of all, I really wanted to thank Justice Albie Sachs for joining us tonight. You truly have made a difference in our lives. Uh, Simon Lewis, Simon, thank you so much for opening this window for us to bring Justice Sachs to join us. Uh, President Ms. Benson, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure to have you all join us. Uh, John White, our interim dean, thank you for carrying the water forward. We're in the midst of a dean search right now, but we would be going nowhere without your leadership. Thank you. Jenny Fowler and Stephanie Alexander, thank you. They put these events together. Where are y'all? Raise your hands. <clears throat> and again, one more time, Brandon, and Michael, Brian and Laura, Brooke, Dan and Megan, thank y'all so much from Motley Rice for making this evening special. Thank you. With that, enjoy your dinner. <laughs>